Chapter 5 Karina sat by the window again that morning. She seems to be more like last time. Naomi had seen her. Naomi thought of a drawing of Ophelia that used to hang in their house. Ophelia dragged by the current glimpse through a wall of reeds. This was Karina that morning. Yet it was so good to see her, to sit down and update her cousin on the people and things in Mexico City. She detailed an exhibit she had been to three weeks prior, knowing Karina would be interested in such things, and then intimated a couple of friends of theirs with such accuracy, a smile formed on her cousin's lips, and Karina laughed. You are so good when you do impressions. Tell me, are you still bent on the theory classes? Karina asked. No, I've been thinking about anthropology, a master's degree. Doesn't that sound interesting? Always with a new idea, Naomi. Always a new pursuit. She heard such a refrain often. She supposed that her family's right to view her university studies skeptically. Seeing as she changed her mind already, thrice about where her interest lays. But she knew rather fiercely that she wanted to do something special with her life. She hasn't found what exactly would it be, although an apology appears to be her to be her more promising than the previous explanations. Explanations? Anyway, when Karina spoke, Naomi didn't mind because her words never sounded like her parents' reproaches. Karina was a creature of sighs and phrases as delicate as Lace. Karina was a dreamer and therefore believed in Naomi's dreams. And you? What have you been up to? Don't think I haven't noticed you hardly right. Have you been pretending you live on a wind suite no more like Wuthering Heights? Naomi asked. Karina has worn out the pages of that book. No, it's the house. The house takes most of my time, Karina said, extending her hand and touching the velvet drapes. Were you planning on remodeling it? I wouldn't blame you if you raised it and barely are new. It's rather ghastly, isn't it? And chilly, too. Damn, there's dampness to it. I was too busy freezing to death last night to mind the dampness. The darkness and the damp, it's always damp and dark and so very cold. As Karina spoke, the smile on her lips died. Her eyes, which has been distant, suddenly fell on Naomi with the sharpness of blade. She clenched Naomi's hand and leaned forward, speaking low. I need you to do me a favor for me, but you can't tell anyone about it. You must promise you won't tell. Promise? I promise. There's a woman in town. Her name is Marta Duval. She made a batch of medicine for me, but I ran out of it. You must go to her and get some more. Do you understand? Yes, of course. What kind of medicine is it? It doesn't matter. What matters is you do it. Will you? Please say you will and tell no one about it. Yes, if you want me to. Karina nodded. She was clutching Naomi's hand so tightly that her nails were digging into the soft flesh of her wrist. Karina, I speak to. Hush, they can hear you, Karina said and went quiet, her eyes bright as polished stones. Who can hear me? Naomi asked slowly, as if her cousin's eyes fixed on her unblinkingly. Karina slowly leaned close to her, whispering in her ear. It's in the walls, she said. What is? Naomi asked, and the question was a reflex, for she found it hard to think about what to ask with her cousin's blank eyes upon her, eyes that didn't seem to see. It was like staring into a sleepwalker's face. The walls speak to me. They tell me secrets. Don't listen to them. Press your hands against your ears, Naomi. They are ghosts. They are real. You see them eventually. Abruptly, Karina raised her cousin, her cousin and stood up, grimacing the curtain with her right hand and staring out the window. Naomi wanted to ask to her to explain herself, but Florence walked in then. Dr. Cummins has arrived. He needs to examine Karina and will meet you in the sitting room later, the woman said. I do not mind staying, Naomi replied, but he mind, Florence told her with a definite Finally, Naomi could have pressed a point, but she elected to leave rather to get into an argument. She knew when to back down, and she could sense that assisting now would be a result in a hostile refuse. 
It might even send her back packing if she made a fuss. She was a guest, but she knew herself to be an inconvenient one. The sitting room in the daytime, once she peeled the curtains aside, seems much less welcoming than at night. For one, it was chilly. The fire had worn the room turned into ashes, and with daylight streaming through the windows, every imperfection was laid bare most strikingly. The faded velour settees appear a sickly green, almost bilious, and there were so many cracks running down the enamel tiles decorating the fireplace. A little oil painting showing a mushroom from different angles. Had it been attacked, ironically, by mold. Tiny black spots mirror its color and defaced the image. Her cousin was right about the dampness. Naomi rubbed her wrist, looking at the place where Karina had dug her nails against her skin and waiting for the doctor to come downstairs. He took his time. And when he walked into the sitting room, he wasn't alone. Ritual accompanied him. She sat at one of the green settees, and the doctor took the other one, sitting his back leather bag at his side. Ritual remained standing. I am Arthur Cummins, the doctor said. You must be Miss Naomi Tabora. The doctor dressed in clothes of a good cut, but which were a decade or two out of fashion. It felt like everyone who visited High Place had been stuck in time, but then she imagined in such a small town there would be a little need to update one's wardrobe. Ritual's clothing, however, seemed fashionable. Either he had bought himself a new wardrobe the last time he'd been in Mexico City, or he considered himself exceptional and his clothes worthy of more expense. Perhaps it was his wife's money that allowed him that allowed a certain lavishness. Yes, thank you for taking the time to speak to me, Naomi said. It's my pleasure. Now, Ritual said you have a few questions for me. I do. They told me that my cousin had tuberculosis. Before she continued, the doctor was nodding and speaking. She does. It's nothing to be concerned about. She's been receiving cypromycin to help her get over it. But the rest cure still holds true. Plenty of sleep, plenty of relaxation, and a good diet are the true solution to this mad lady. The doctor took off his glasses and took out a handkerchief, proceeding to clean the cleanse as he speak, spoke. A ice bag on the head or a alcohol rub, that's really what all this is about. It will pass. Soon she'll be right as rain. Now, if you excuse me. The doctor stuffed the glasses in the breast pocket of his jacket, no doubt tending to leave the conversation at that, but it was Naomi's turn to interrupt him. No, I won't excuse you yet. Karina is very odd. When I was a little girl, I remember my aunt, Brigida, had tuberculosis, and she did not act like Karina at all. Every patient is different. She wrote a very uncharacteristic letter to my father, and she seems unlike herself, Naomi said, trying to put her impressions into words. She has changed. Tuberculosis doesn't change a person. It's merely intensifying the traits that the patient already possesses. Well then, there's definitely something wrong with Carolina, because she never possessed like this lessness. She has such an odd look about her. The doctor took out his glasses and put them on again. He must not like what he saw and frowned. It did not let me finish, the doctor muttered, sounding snappiness. His eyes were very hard. She pressed her lips together. Your cousin is a very anxious girl, quite melancholic, and the illness has intensified this. Karina is not anxious. You deny her depressive intensities. Naomi recalled what her father had said in Mexico City. He called Karina melodramatic, but melodramatic and anxious, anxious were not the same thing at all, and Karina had definitely never heard voices in Mexico City. She hadn't had the bizarre expression on her face. 
What depressive tendencies, Naomi asked. When her mother died, she became a withdrawn, Rachel said. She had periods of great melancholy, crying in her room and talking nonsense. It's worse now. He had not spoken until then, and now he chose to bring that up. And not only to bring it up, but to speak with a careful detachment, as he were describing a stranger instead of his wife. Yes, and as you said, her mother had died, Naomi replied, and that was years and years ago when she was a little girl. Perhaps you find certain things come back, he said. Although tuberculosis is hardly a death sense, it can still be upsetting for the patient. The doctor explained, the isolation, the physical symptoms. Your cousin has suffered from chills and night sweats. They're not a pretty sight, I assure you. And codeine provides temporary relief. You can't expect her to be cheery and baking pies. I'm concerned she's my cousin after all. Yes, but if you begin to get agitated too, then we won't be better off, will we? The doctor said, shaking his head. Now, I really must be going. I'll see you next week, virtual doctor, she said. No, no, I will be going. The doctor repeated like a man who had become aware of an impending muni aboard a ship. The doctor shook Naomi's hand, grabbed his back, and off he went, leaving her upon the grotesque cetace, biting her lips and not knowing quite what to say. Rachel took the spot the doctor had evacuated and leaned back, aloof. If there ever was a man who had ice in his veins, it was this one. His face was bloodiness. Had he really accorded Karina, accorded anyone? She could not picture him expressions of affection towards any living thing. Dr. Cummins is a very capable person, he said, with a voice that was indifferent. A voice that indicated he will not have care if Cummins was the best the worst person on earth. His father was the family's doctor, and now he watches over our health. I assure you, he has never found lacking in any way. I'm sure he's a good doctor. You do not sound sure. She shrugged, trying to make a light of it, thinking that if she kept a smile on her face and her words were airy, he might be more receptive. After all, he seems to be taking this whole matter lightly. If Karina is ill, then she might be better off in a sanatorium close to Mexico City, somewhere where she can be attended to properly. You don't believe I can attend to my wife? I didn't say that. But this house is cold and the fog outside is not the most uplifting sight. This is the mission that your father gave you? Rachel asked. That you will come here and snatch Karina away? She shook her head no. It feels like it, he said briskly, though he did not sound upset. The words remained cold. I realize that my home is not the most modern and most fashionable there is. High Place was once a beacon, a shining jewel of the house, and the mine produced so much silver that we could afford to cram amours with silk and velvet and fill our cups with the finest wine. It is not so many anymore. But we know how to take care of ill people. My father is old. He's not in perfect health. Yet we tend him. We tend to him. Eloquently. I wouldn't do any less for the woman I marry. Still, I would like to ask, perhaps, what Kalina needs is a specialist in other matters, a psychiatrist. He laughed so lo- loudly, she jumped a little in her in seat. For until now, his face had been very serious, and the laughter was unpleasant. The laughter challenged her, and his eyes settled on her. A psychiatrist? And where you may find one around these parts? You think he might be summoned out of thin air? There's a public clinic in town with a single doctor and nothing more. You hardly find a psychiatrist there. We have to head to Pachuca, maybe even to Mexico City in French one. I thought they'd come. At least a doctor at the clinic might offer a second opinion, or maybe, or might he might have other ideas about Carolina. 
There's a reason why my father bought his own doctor from England. It's not because the health care in this place was magnificent. The town is poor and the people there are coarse. Primitive, if not a place crawling with doctors. I must insist. Yes, yes, I do believe you will insist. He said, standing up, the striking blue eyes still unkindly fixed on her. You get your way in doing most things, do you, Miss Tabora? Your father does as you wish. Men do as you wish. He reminded her of a fellow she danced with at the party the previous summer. They had been having fun, briskly stepping into a dance on, and then came time for the ballet. During some enchanted evening, the man held her far too tightly and tried to kiss her. She turned her head, and when she looked at him again, there was pure, dark mockery across his features. Naomi stared back at Rachel, and he stared at her with the same sort of mockery. A bitter, ugly stare. What do you mean, she asked, challenging, peppering the question. I recall Karina mentioning how insistent you can be when you want a a bow to do your bidding. I won't fight you. Get your second opinion if you find it. He said with a chilling. Finally, as he walked out of the room, she felt a little pleased to have needled him. She sensed that he had expected as the doctor that she would accept his words merely. That night, she dreamed that a golden flower spouted from the walls in her room. Only it wasn't. She didn't think it was a flower. It had tendrils, yet it wasn't a vine. And next to the not flower rose a hundred other tiny golden forms. Mushrooms, she thought, finally recognizing the bulbous shapes. And as she walked towards the wall, intruded and attracted by the glow, she brushed her hand against these forms. The golden bulb seemed to turn into smoke, bursting and rising, falling like a dust upon the floor. Her hands were coated in this dust. She attempted to clean it off, wiping her hands on her nightgown. But the golden dust clung to her palms, and went on under, under her nails. Golden dust swirled around her and lifted up the room, bathing in a soft yellow light. When she looked above, she saw the dust glittering like a miniature stars against the ceiling and below on the rug. It was another golden swirl of stars. She brushed her foot forward, disturbing the dust on the rug, and it bounced up into the air again, then fell. Suddenly, Naomi was aware of, the, of a presence in the room. She raised her head, her hand pressed against her nightgown, and she saw someone standing by the door. It was a woman in a dress of a yellow antique lace. Where her face thought to have been there was a glow, golden like that of the mushrooms on the wall. The woman's glow grew stronger, then it dimmed. It was like watching a firefly in the summer night sky. Next to Yaomi, the wall had started to quiver, breathing to the same rhythm as the golden woman. Beneath her, the floorboards pulsed to a heart, life, and knowing. The golden filaments that had merged together with the mushrooms covered the wall like a netting and continued to grow. She noticed then that the woman's dress was not made of lace, but instead of woven with the same filaments. The woman raised a gloved hand and pointed at Naomi, and she opened her mouth. But not having no mouth since her face was a golden blur, no words came out. Naomi had not felt scared, not until now, but this, the woman attempting to speak, made her indescribably afraid, a fear that traveled down her spine to the soles of her feet, forcing Naomi to step back and press her hands against her lips. She had no lips, and when she tried to take another step back, she realized that her feet had fused to the ground. The golden woman reached forward, 
reached towards her and held Naomi's space between her hands. The woman made a noise like the crunching of the leaves, like the dipping of water onto a pond, like the buzzing of insects in a pitch black darkness, and Naomi wished to press her hands against her ears, but she had no hands anymore. Naomi woke, opened her eyes, dripped and sweat. For a minute, she didn't remember where she was. Then she recalled she had been invited to high place. She reached for a glass of water she left by the bedside and almost knocked it down. She gloved down the whole glass and turned her head. The room was in shadows. No light, golden or otherwise, dotted the wall surface. Nevertheless, she had an impulse to rise and run her hands against the wall as to make sure there was nothing strange lurking behind the wallpaper.